Today's big decision, golf shirt or four-way spandex? You're looking good. Welcome to number 13. As you can see, I've got a roof in place. And before I get into the textiles that I intend to use for this, the reasons for doing so, let me take a minute to show you the roof itself. So to date, this is all built with styrene or ABS. I've got the inner structures in place and it's starting to become a pretty solid piece at this point. So I took the time to make the detail nice enough that if you look up through the window from outside the truck and see the inside of the roof, it still looks realistic. There's now enough structure inside that is getting quite strong. It's held into place in six lower locations, as well as these two upper front tabs. These upper tabs will be held on by clips, much like the ones in this picture. Wherever this is blue right now is where there'll be fabric. The tape is on here to protect this from the primer. I want this to remain raw plastic underneath here so I get the best adhesion between my fabric, the adhesive, and the ABS. Originally, all this was supposed to be built out of brass, so all the structure was supposed to be metal. Then I was supposed to use this four-way spandex, stretch it over top so it looked really realistic. To compensate, I've taken one 8 solid stock, I've cut it down the center. It'll be glued to the roof here, somewhere in the middle, and in the back. The profile of this inner structure kind of shapes the top of the roof, so my hopes are that uh, by adding these parts up top before the fabric's put on, it'll give the illusion of this being a real top. I mentioned earlier that I had to decide between golf shirt and uh, four-way spandex. Uh, neither is the answer. I've spent a bunch of time body working this and smoothing things out. I spent several days trying to get the materials to adhere to the roof properly and get all my seams looking good and I was getting really poor results. I don't know if it was the fact I was rushing or using the wrong product, but I've switched gears. So I've body worked this. I've uh, got the rod on here. I've smoothed it out. Uh, the transitions are now smoothed out between using some Bondo and it's got several coats of primer on it. I'm going to get into the two part putty next and then I'm going to get to the next stages of detail. A bit more time's passed. I'm happy with the results. I added some styrene along this leading edge and back here so it looked like the seams or the pleats in the fabric. Now I do know that I want it to look very similar to the truck pictured here, except this will not be running the upper doors. It will however have a very similar rolled up rear quarter window and back window. You can see I'm starting out with clear cover sheet plastic and cutting the fit over my patterns. I start to cut my spandex strips using a technique I learned during the two days of dicking around with the original roof idea. Spandex is a bitch to cut straight, so strips of fine line taper used. This not only helps keep the weave straight, but it makes perfect guides and keeps it rigid enough that you can cut this stuff with scissors. Now I'm laying the tape down on the windows as both guides and to keep the glue off the section to remain clear. I glue on the vertical strips first, they're spandex. The skinny ones on the top are the same material that I used for the seat belts. The wider ones in the bottom are once again the original belts from the uh, racing seatbelt kit. So I took some time to trim off the excess material, then I used a piece of brass to roll them up at all the same size. I used elastics to hold them together during assembly. Next I cut the cable ties and I'm just simply trimming off the square edges from the tab at the top so they'll drop into place on these styrene rails. I glue using a little CA and then uh, hit it with some kicker just to speed things up a bit. I follow up by adding uh, the spandex strips to finish these parts. The E6000 sets up fast enough uh, behind the spandex that you can work with these parts in about a half an hour if you're really careful with stuff. I check that my hands are attached and not leaking. Then I puncture the spandex and loop the ties around and eventually back through the holes. And this is just enough that they're held into place until the next step. A bit more trimming. And finally, I can slide the window rolls into place and tighten the zip ties. I adjust them all so they're the same diameter and then trim the zip ties and cut off those temporary elastics. Little test fit, I think we're good. After wrapping up some final modeling details and some paint touch-ups, the roof and I, we've become friends. It's nice. I like it now. It's definitely a solid structure in comparison to my original idea, that fabric top. And while I haven't given up on the fabric top, it just won't happen on this vehicle. Now I took some time with three different types of clear to spray the roof out. 
I used gloss, semi, and matte finishes to spray the roof so it looked a little less like plastic. Anything made to look like the solid surfaces on the real truck, like these window surrounds or the inner structure of the roof, those got gloss and semi-gloss. And then anything that had to look like fabric, that got a matte clear. Before we get to the big ticket item for the day, I want to put the uh, swing out gas carrier back on. It now houses our license plate, at least the temporary plate. Uh, where this is going, the plate isn't even the same shape. So it's just tacked on until it arrives at its new home. As you can imagine, today's a very exciting day around the shop. I'm putting the finishing touches on the icon. And this little guy, well, he plays a really important part in all of this. Little Jonathan here is a one-off scale figure by Matt Hicks, and he's now part of a large collection that we've been working towards for quite a few years together. Now, before anybody gets emotional and gets twisted up, this is not meant to look exactly like Jonathan. It's meant to look like him, like he's part of the series, and all the characters kind of have the same look and feel. But Matt takes a lot of effort to add all kinds of scale detail so it looks like the person, like the hat the skin tone, facial hair, eye color. He's got a uh, lizard on his chest, so you know the little guy has some brand awareness going. Also, he took some time to do the face of the watch. This looks like Icon's first watch design, which was the Jump Hour, I believe, which is very cool. Matt did the original sculpt for Bill back in 2011 when I was on the Jeep Mangler project with Jason Wall. And what's really neat is this truck is going to the same collection. So now the very first bill will live amongst the same shelves as the first of the next generation. So because the big bill figure is the foundation for this one, I can use this to show you some of the components that makes it really special. Now, back before this existed, anytime I wanted a male figure, I had to use a Tamiya Well Willy body. And part of the problem with that is that it had static arms. So part of my challenge to Matt as we were doing the Mangler project was to make me a figure with moving arms. And this is what he came up with. Each arm is made up of seven components. You have your upper, your forearm, and your hand. They all have a ball joint between them at the wrist, the elbow, and the shoulder. And they're all held together with elastic band. And that's one of the nicest things is that these aren't complicated. They're reliant on the objects they're attached to to make them move. I'll show you what I mean here. If this hand was clutching a mechanically actuated shifter, it would force the arm back and forth. In the same fashion that if this is hooked up to a steering wheel, this arm would move as well. Now this is a little clunky. This is again my mock-up. The elastic in here is really, really old. It's brittle. It could snap at any time at this point. I've used this so many times. So probably one of the better working examples of this figure is in the Mangler video I made uh, quite a few years back. You can see that the movement is subtle, and this is because of the choice in ratio and speed of the servos that I use. This is just my own personal preference, but I don't think you need a full rotation of the wheel to get a neat effect. Now that you also know how it works, you'll also know that uh, full rotation could lead to a pretty gross dislocation, which I have uh, quite a strong knowledge of. While it's subtle in the video, you can see that he looks left and right when he steers, and that's really easy to do with these models because Matt leaves enough room in the back for a micro servo. As you can see on little Mr. Ward here, I've installed a servo in his back. There's a rod that attaches to this. It travels up through his neck hole. Neck hole is a word, right? Anyways, it goes up through the old neck hole and into his head. Quite often I'll leave the heads loose on these so I can swap them out for a different style if I want to. Matt's done a bunch of different runs of these in different styles, some with helmets, some with hair. He can also do complete custom work if you want something built in your likeness. He can do that as well and they're easily swappable and it will still look left and right when it steers. So the main difference between the new figure and the original Big Bill is that this one does not have the five-point harness modeled in. It's just not necessary. Also, his legs have been extended. Back when these were built, the space and scale interiors was a little bit more limited. Usually it ran a three-quarter interior, which justified a shorter leg. It was an optical illusion, but it's just not necessary anymore. And it's glaringly obvious that the legs were kind of hovering above the floor too far when you look down. Now, Matt created the driver to fit into Dion's seat, specifically. It looks like he's sunk down into the bolsters and into the uh, seat cushion itself. It makes him look like he's actually sitting in the seat. They work really nicely together. So, of course, I'm quite fortunate that Dion did all the heavy lifting on these seats. All I really had to do besides paint and detail is add these adjusters, which is just styrene rod bent, painted, and glued to the bottom. I used stainless steel paper clips to make the bars for the headrest. 
Now these are glued in, but I think you could pretty easily make these adjustable if you wanted to. I chose to glue mine so they all stay at the same height that always look nice and tidy. <laughs> and it sounds bad. <laughs> we could spend some time unpacking that, or you could watch me clean the bench as I prep to bolt the driver in this truck for the last time. If you want one of Dion's best top replica seats, you can find them here. They're made to order. And while you're doing this, make sure you check out some of his 3D engine designs because they're killer too. As for the driver, it's a little trickier, still possible nonetheless. Now Matt said he would do a limited production run of these if the demand's high enough. So send him a message, tell him you're interested, and then get in line. They're a handcrafted, hand-painted item. But they're worth the wait. You ask anybody that owns them, they'll have multiples for a reason. I'm installing the floor mount for the belt first. You'll also notice that the buckle is already in the receiver, and that's just because it's such a tight fit that I didn't want to have to worry about installing it with the driver in and slip and potentially scratch something. So I'm feeding it through there first, looping it back, and then just making enough space that I can slide the driver into place and get them bolted in. I hook up both servo leads, the one from the head and from the steering wheel. I use this splitter plug to hook up both the servo from the head and the one from the wheel. I draw the belt around the driver's belly, over a shoulder, and through the upper part of the seat belt assembly. Now all I have to do is drop this straight down into the retractable mechanism, but I do not want to do that on camera. It requires a little bit of hand yoga to pull this off, and I do not want to glue this and worry about filming at the same time. This is the time that silly little mistakes happen and you get glue in spots that it's not supposed to be. So while I'm doing that, I'm also going to go and I'm going to tack the belt in a few spots so it looks like there's the right amount of slack in it. I'm also going to glue the left hand to the wheel and find a comfortable spot for the right so it looks like he's kind of casual as he's driving around. As I bring the final segment of the Scale 44 Bench Series with Icon to a close, I have to tell you, there are a few times where I didn't think we were going to make it, but we did, and I'm thrilled to be bench testing this truck for the final time. Everything functions as intended. It drives well. You can see that it steers well. There's no binding. Now you might hear a little bit of a squeak out of the truck, and that's only because I choose not to lubricate the outer portions of the axles or the drive shafts until everything is detailed. And this just prevents any pain issues or reactions like fisheye. I'll be taking care of this, the balance of the scale and paint detailing. I'll be adding things like these emblems on the fenders, like the shift instructions for the glove box door. I also haven't added the company mascot yet. That lizard is missing from the grill. Now I have to make it from scratch. I'm not sure how I'm gonna do it yet, but it's gonna be a fun challenge. I wanna do it last. I want it to be the last piece to go on this truck. If you want to see more on this and all the other projects I do outside of RC stuff, you can find me in two places, my YouTube channel and Instagram. For now, thanks for watching, stay cool, stay creative.